If you like what you watch, then don't forget to follow us on Facebook and Twitter for the latest updates on The More Show. Remember to subscribe to our YouTube channel for new weekly television and radio shows. Hello and welcome. My guest is Richard Freeman, who is one of Britain's few professional cryptozoologists. His interest in unknown animals reaches back to his childhood, and throughout his career he has worked with over 400 species of animals. He has travelled extensively around the world exploring rare and endangered species, and now works for the Centre of Fortean Zoology, the UK's only cryptozoologist organisation. Richard Freeman, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. So Richard, tell me a bit about your work. I'm the Zoological Director of the Centre for Fortean Zoology, which is an organisation set up by Jonathan Downs in the 1990s. Uh, we're the only organisation of its kind in the world. Uh, we write and research into mystery animals, and every year we set up an expedition going around the world looking for a cryptid or unknown animal. If you wanted to be melodramatic, you could call me a monster hunter. <laughs> well, that's what some may call you. Yeah, that's mm. right. I'm, 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 and, uh, so, OK, so let's just summarise. Right? So what does cryptozoology mean, then? It's literally crypto-hidden zoology, hidden zoology. It's a term that was <clears throat> first coined uh, in the 1950s by Dr Bernard Heuvelmans, and it refers to animals that are either unknown to science although native people might be very familiar with them, um, animals that are erroneously thought to be extinct but might still be around, like the Tasmanian wolf or thylacine, and certain types of animals that grow much larger than science says that they should, like the giant anaconda. Right, so, OK, <coughs> how, how, how... I mean, you, you, you say that they're unknown animals, so why hasn't mainstream science, then, looked for these animals? Because... Mainstream science seems to be stuck in a rut. Back in Victorian days, there was an ethos of searching and discovery. Nowadays, everybody seems to be terribly frightened to do anything that their peers might deem as slightly controversial. Now, um, large animals are being discovered all the time. Uh, there's a new species of tapir from South America recently, a new species of peccary, which is a pig-like animal. Back in the 90s, there was the Vu Quang ox in Vietnam. So we know <coughs> large animals still exist. But there is this bizarre blind spot science seems to have. Yeah. Now, for example, if a, uh, a physicist wanted to write a book or a paper on a particle that no one has ever seen, but it's just inferred by the reaction of other particles around it, that's fine. But if someone wanted to write a book or a paper on an animal that maybe thousands of people have seen, but is unknown to science, that would be deemed controversial. Uh, a colleague of mine, Adam Davis, brought back some hair from the Indonesian island of Sumatra, which he thought might belong to the orang pendek, an upright walking species of ape unknown to science, found there. And it was examined by Professor Hans Brunner, the world's leading expert on mammal hair. And he proclaimed it to be a new species. He said it was related to the orangutan, but distinct from it. Together, they prepared a paper for Nature. And Nature, the, the editor of Nature, said he wasn't going to run it because it was too controversial, because they were dealing with a large animal. He said, if it was a new species of mouse, yeah. there would be no problem, which seems utterly insane. So what's happened with this piece of hair that was found then? How far has it gone in the scientific community? It ended there. Uh, Brunner um, described it as, as being unknown to science, related to the orangutan, but distinct. Now, when I was last in Sumatra, we found some hair from this creature, and it was analysed by Lars Thomas and his team from the University of yeah. Copenhagen. He's another expert in mammal hair, amongst other things. Right. And his conclusion was, this is from a, a large unknown species of primate but mainstream science seems to take no notice. And how do you feel about that then, when you know, this is your <coughs> life and, and, the, and this is your sort of career, the path that you've taken, and your mm. work's not taken seriously? Well, the thing is that the, the um, late Professor Grover Krantz in um, the States, he said if he had got a dead Sasquatch 
in, which, which is a big foot, yeah. by the way, for the audience. Yeah. In, in his in his lecture hall, he would have to go and grab other scientists by the scruff of the neck, bring them in, and rub their faces in it before they would look at it. Yeah. So the, the, the proofs in them actually seem, <coughs> otherwise they're, they're not going to yeah, go for it. Yeah, it seemed utterly insane and but why totally do you think that is? Why do you think, again, why is mainstream science, again, not taking it, I'll ask you the question again, why is it not taking it seriously? I, I really have no idea. I, I think it may, it may be to do with people are, are scared that people are, are, are going to think that their peers will think that they're foolish or strange or they might be afraid of having their funding taken away from them. So it depends where their funding's from? It's, I think it's a variety of reasons, but uh, it's a downright cowardice. So let's start uh, with your background here just a little bit before mm. we move in with any of this, this, the sort of unknown uh, species. Where, how did you first sort of really get taken interest in this? I joined the wrong queue at the job centre. <laughs> <laughs> no. I know the feeling. <laughs> no, no, back, uh, back in the early 70s, uh, when I was growing up, I was an enormous fan of Doctor Who with the, the wonderful John Pertwee. And in that in incarnation, the Doctor was trapped on Earth. So all the monsters were on Earth, so they were more compelling when they're on your doorstep rather than on an alien planet. And you had wonderful things like intelligent marine dinosaurs, the sea devils, and yeah. giant, giant green maggots coming out of slag heaps in Wales, <laughs> and then yeah. the autons, the, the dolls that came to life. And it was all so dark and terrifying. So, so do you think, if you never had the sort of sci-fi interest initially, do you think you would have gone down this path? That's a very good question. No one's ever asked it me before. Probably not. I've always been interested in animals. You see, that's what first got me interested in strange creatures. And then a little later on, when I was older, I heard the stories of things like the Yeti and sea serpents and the, and the Tasmanian wolf and creatures like that, and I became utterly fascinated. Um, when I left a, a, a school, I became a zookeeper, yeah. uh, specialising in reptiles. So I've always had an interest in animals, and I suppose I've always been interested in animals. What are some of the key species that you investigate? Some of the key, the, the key, the key cryptozoology creatures? I'm investigating a number of things. Um, the one that we go back to again and again because we've got so much success with it and we really want to crack it is the Orang Pendek. Uh, okay. It means short man in Malayan. It's a unknown species of upright walking ape from the island of Sumatra. Uh, it's reported to be between three and five feet tall, so not enormous like the mainland no. yeti, but very powerfully built, immensely strong. It has long hair that's yep. either, either black or a, a sort of um, goldish colour. Comes in two colour phases. Uh, it's been reported for a, a very long time, and not only by natives, but uh, by Western researchers such as Debbie Marta, who's the head of the yeah. Indonesian Tiger Conservation Group. And what's the evidence then that this creature exists? Well. I've been there three times. I'm going back in September for a fourth crack at it. I've seen its prints, and I've worked with all the great apes in captivity, and I've seen their prints in all sorts of mediums, and the print of the Orang Pendek is quite distinct. I've heard its cry. I, uh, my colleague Dave Archer and our native guide Sahar actually saw the creature when we were wow. last there. So I'm utterly convinced uh, of its existence, and it's been seen by so many um, good witnesses such as Debbie Martyr and Jeremy Holden, the wildlife photographer. What evidence does it leave behind apart from hair? I mean, is it, it hair tracks? We've never found any dung yet. No. But no. if you if you're talking about a body, you're in a rainforest. When an animal dies, the carcass is devoured and rendered down in next to no time. Are these even, intelligent even the creatures, bones. though? Um, they would probably be about as intelligent as an orangutan. Okay. They're solitary. They live mainly on the ground. Unlike the orangutan, which is completely that's completely arboreal. Right, and you think you've got a good chance of finding one? Well, our team found one when we were last there. This time, we want to catch it on film. Right, right, okay. But where does Bigfoot fit into the family then? Oh, because I'm fascinated with, with Bigfoot. How does that work? The Bigfoot. Come well, into it? it seems the descriptions of it seem very similar to the yeti, the larger type of yeti. What people don't realise is there's more than one type of yeti. There seems to be three distinct types of yeti, which the name yeti means rock beast, incidentally. Um, something we should clear up from the start is that the yeti isn't white. That's, that's <laughs> a, it's a, big, a yeah. big mistake everybody makes. It's black or a sort of dark chocolate brown in colour. It seems to be a huge upright walking ape reported from Tibet, the Himalayas, northern India, 
Just last year, I went into northern India to look for this creature, and we found some tracks. Locally, they call it the Mandai Burung. Right. And we talked to a number of people who had seen it, and they were all describing the same animal, looking like a huge, upright, walking gorilla. And has, has there ever been any reports of it attacking the people there? There or? are very, very, very rare reports. Um, a lot, they're very frightened of it because it looks big and, and ferocious looking. And we talked to a, an elderly man who back in the 60s said he was chased by one. It was making a, a terrible roaring noise and chased him in the jungle. But that may well have just been a display like a, a mountain gorilla does. Right, so they could be quite friendly then? I, I would say if you didn't anger them, um, they, they would probably just leave you alone. One might display in, in the way that a, a, a gorilla does. There are occasional reports of, of yetis lifting up huge rocks and hurling them and things, but generally <coughs> they're thought to leave people alone. When we were in Russia, uh, on the track of the Almasti, which is something different again, much more man-like, uh, maybe of the genus Homo rather than a, a, a true ape, a, a, a relative of the ancestors of man. Yeah. We heard stories of these creatures coming quite close to habitation in the carbadino balcaria right. region of the Caucasus. And um, there's one story about one that killed a guard dog with a club and entered a house and stole some cheese because they associate humans and human... Um, habitation with, with food. Yeah. Uh, we heard another story about one man who saw one near a grain store, threw a, threw a stone at it, uh, only to have the creature he heft up a huge rock <laughs> and throw it back at him. Amazing. That's some strength then, isn't it? Uh, yeah, yeah they, apparently it took two men to lift this rock. And one of, one of the strangest encounters I ever had was when, I in Russia in 2008, near the town of Neutrino, uh, a couple of miles from Neutrino, we were staking out an old farmhouse that had been abandoned since the 70s. Yeah and occasionally shepherds go and sit on the veranda of an evening. And a few years earlier, the door of the veranda opened, according to the story, and a massive right. male almasty, about seven feet tall, walked onto the veranda, got one of the men, picked him up, just moved him out of the way, carried on along the veranda and jumped off the end. Um, we staked the place out. Yeah. And if you can imagine, there are three buildings and an L-shaped veranda running around yeah. them. Um, we were in one of the buildings at about 2.30 in the morning, warming ourselves around a little stove because we'd been out all night. Yeah, <coughs> the door was a few inches ajar, about five inches ajar, with very clear night, moonlight, starlight streaming in. My colleague, Adam Davis, and I hear this strange, deep, guttural vocalisation. The nearest I can get to it is sort of a bum, 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 bum sound, but it's very much deeper yeah. than a human yeah. throat could make. It definitely wasn't a human uh, hey, messing it. around. Though. Yeah, and, and, I said, and I said to him, did you hear that? And he said, yeah. Then about 25 seconds later, something walked along the veranda. Now, whatever that something was, it was on two legs, so it wasn't a bear. It moved past the door, and the door to this room was seven feet tall and it blocked off the moonlight and the starlight to a height of seven feet. So whatever it was, it was seven feet tall, and it walked along this veranda. And I said to Adam, did you see that? And he yeah. says, yes, there's something on the veranda. We grab our cameras, run outside, find just silence and darkness. Whatever it was, it had gone back so, into the night. So you, you did, you, you know, you've had a few near <laughs> experiences there. Yeah. So would you say that when, when people say these are intelligent creatures, how do you feel about that? I think, well, the Almasti, we think, is a primitive hominid. It's a relic hominid, possibly another descendant of Homo erectus. So it's going to have a near-human intelligence. It doesn't make fire, as far as we know. It uses very primitive tools. Um, <coughs> the Yeti and the Orang Pendak seem to be apes that are related to the orangutan. Uh, they use primitive tools as well, but they're a lot less human-like. So they would have a more ape-like intelligence. We're just going to go for a short break now. Don't go anywhere, and we'll be right back to talk with Richard. Visit themoreshow.co.uk forward slash shop to purchase products and services from your favourite past guests. If you're new to this site, you can also catch up on the previous television and radio shows through YouTube and the More Show website. Welcome back. For those who have just joined, I'm here with cryptozoologist Richard Freeman. Richard, welcome back. Now, just tell me about the death worm. The Mongolian death worm, yes. I went out to look for that in the Gobi Desert in 2005. The stories sound quite fantastical when you first hear them. They, locals call it Alroy Hoi Hoi, which means intestine worm, because they say it looks like a length of cow's intestine. 
The stories go that it can spit a corrosive yellow saliva that acts like acid, and it can also generate blasts of electricity powerful enough to kill a man or even a camel. Now, when you actually go over there and talk to the nomads, it's quite different. We travelled for about a thousand miles through the Gobi Desert, talking to many, many different nomads who had seen the creature. And what they are describing, all these witnesses, is about two feet long, mm. reddish brown in colour, scaly, and shaped rather like a salami, hard to tell the head from the tail. The blasts of electricity, or throwing lightning as they call it, they say that's just folkloric, but they're very frightened of it because they believe it's highly poisonous and can spit, although no one has actually, that we spoke to, actually knew anyone who'd been killed by it or had even seen it spitting. Most people just saw it lying in the desert and ran away because they were frightened. One man saw it devour a mouse, uh, one woman saw it slithering in and out of holes, uh, one man even picked it up on the end of a stick. I think what we're dealing with is some sort of burrowing reptile, maybe, rather than a true, true worm, uh, maybe an amphisbana. Uh, an amphisbana are, are a group of burrowing reptiles that are related to snakes and lizards, but they are distinct from both, and they have this weird sausage sort of shape. I think this is a, a giant, undiscovered species of, of this animal. And probably the stories about its venom is also utterly apocryphal. But the stories we heard all dovetailed wonderfully from dozens of witnesses over about a thousand miles. So we're, we're dealing with a large, burrowing, worm-like reptile, yes, unknown to science. Yes. So, so would you say this is on your agenda to still sort of discover? Or? Certainly, I definitely want to go back to Mongolia again. Uh, I think it's, it's, because this is not a large animal, we're not talking a, a 30 foot lake monster or a, a 10 foot yeti. This is something I could catch, because I'm used to handling reptiles, and bring back. If we could find one, it's something I could catch quite easily if I saw it. Right, okay. Well, one of the creatures I want to talk about as well is the, um, the dragons of Africa. Ah, oh, the Ninka Nanka. Yeah. Um, <coughs> the thing you've got to realise about dragons is that they are the most ancient, powerful and widespread of all monsters. Forget demons, forget vampires, forget werewolves. The dragon predates them all. It's found in every single culture on Earth. There are even cave paintings of it going back 25,000 years, which suggests there's something to it more than just folklore. Uh, worldwide, they're more associated with water, the element of water and living in and around water and being associated with rainfall than they are with fire. That's a ra rather recent European thing. Um, in West Africa, when we investigated the stories of the Ninka Nanka, which is a huge serpentine creature with a crest, uh, people there were terrified because they, they thought that if you looked on one of them, or if one of them looked on you, you would die within five years. Right. So was yeah. the superstition. And yeah. we, we, we found a whole village that had been abandoned because they'd supposedly seen one of these things. A whole village? A whole village, yeah. yeah. I think it's more likely to have been, in this case, a demonization of a pre-Islamic python cult rather than a real animal. But uh, back in 2000, Year of the Dragon, I searched for a creature called the Naga in Indochina which once again is a huge serpentine creature with a crest on its head. A black, glossy scales with a greenish sheen, huge size, 60 feet or more. Yeah. And talked to very many witnesses who were all describing this immense serpentine animal in and around the Mekong River. Then when I was in India, just last year, looking for the Mande Burung, the Indian Yeti, we also heard stories of an identical creature that they call the Sankuni there, an enormous snake or snake-like animal, yeah. with a fin or crest that recalls the comb of a rooster on its head, once again associated with water. So, uh, and I've heard similar stories in Mongolia, so they, these stories go all around the world, and they're all so alike, so you have to think there's something there. So have you heard, I mean, are these able uh, uh, creatures, these dragons, are they, uh, are they winged or...? Most of them are, are described as being very snake-like, serpentine, long. Um, some of the stories say they have small legs and small, what look like wings or fins right. on the back, yeah. but very small in relationship to the body. If you imagine an oriental dragon, much more like that, yeah. an association with water, which of course dragons in Japan, China, Korea yeah. have always been associated. And then when was the last sort of sightings of these creatures then? Uh, there were sightings in uh, Lake Tianqi in China as recently as 2004. Video sightings, or I don't know. 
it was a mass sighting, and the creature was supposed to have this horse-like face and a long serpentine body. Uh, <coughs> dozens and dozens and dozens of people were supposed to have seen it at the same time as it came out of the water, but I don't know if it was filmed. It, if, if the film exists, it's never reached the West. Again, did you, did you get in contact with these people? I mean, have you, have you managed to...? No, I've not managed to get in contact with anybody no. from, from China. No. So, so uh, oh, OK, then. So with these, uh, with these dragon creatures, how, I mean, how far in the Texas do they go back to? Before the written word. Right. In France, there are cave paintings because of these creatures 25,000 yeah. years old. Because if you look at, for Wales, for example, it's, yeah. it's legends are full of dragons, aren't they? Yeah. Well, in Britain alone, there's a, roughly 100 legends of dragons. That includes winged, fire-breathing dragons that have four legs, the smaller two-legged wyvern, the crawling serpentine worm, the winged wyver, which is like a winged serpent, the basilisk. There's roughly about... A uh, hundred legends, countrywide. Yeah. yeah, I mean, yeah. do you think Just you'll ever, ever sort of get close to one yourself? To, to <laughs> I don't think there are any <laughs> whales, certainly. With something like that, a large reptile, you've got to be looking in the tropics. Right, OK. And that's where a lot of the sightings have come yeah. from. OK. And you've mentioned there a lot of these the serpent creatures. What sort of uh, creatures in, in the water have sort of come, investigations have come your way? Uh, well... The Naga, like I said, was supposed to, supposed to live in and around water, as was the Ninkinanka. Um, I've been up to Loch Ness and Loch Murrah, uh, searching for the creatures there, which I believe to be gigantic eels. I don't think there's anything... You, you, there's no way a prehistoric reptile could live in Loch Ness. Um, it's more likely to be Elvis in a rubber suit than it is to be a prehistoric. Right. So you, 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 you don't buy the, the pictures, then, that, that were taken off the, off the creature? Um, it depends which ones you mean. Uh, the, the famous surgeon's photograph, which everyone says is a hoax, I don't think is a hoax. I think it's a picture of a water bird. I think the story of a hoax is a hoax, but I don't think it's the Loch Ness Monster. No. I think what you're dealing with is a large, sterile, mutant strain of the common eel. But isn't it possible um, that, that, obviously, uh, some, some researchers have claimed that uh, this creature has been trapped in the, in the, in the loch? Quite possibly, yeah. yeah. But I don't think there's... there's ever more than a handful of them. I think it's a mutant strain that occurs from the ordinary population of eels. Right, so this would be a big eel then? <laughs> yeah, we're talking yeah. 25, 30 feet. Yeah. So, you, yeah. so with your future work then, where is that going to take you? Well, we're returning to Sumatra in September and we've got a load of other projects we'd like to do. I mean, we're always looking for sponsorship. It's always down to the green folding stuff. We've never got enough money to do enough research that we want to do. So you know, if there's any company that wanted to sponsor us, we would happily wear their logo. We would call it the X company or whatever company, yeah. Expedition, yeah. and we'd do whatever it took to, to yeah. promote their um, their okay. product if they if they were to And, and that, would, that would help you get to Sumatra, wouldn't it? Uh, yeah, it would help with Sumatra. And we've got other things on the cards. There's a lake in uh, southern Siberia called Lake Chani. Yeah. In the last 17 years, sorry, in the sorry, in the last um, in the last seven years, 19 people have allegedly been killed by something in the lake, which locals describe as being serpentine and 30 feet long. Uh, one woman saw her son, an ex-soldier, on a boat out on the lake when this thing, whatever it was, ran the boat. He fell into the water. It grabbed him, pulled him under, never seen again. Another fisherman, similar thing happened. Two guys fishing on a boat. The creature attacked the boat, they fell into the water, one of them was grabbed and pulled under and his mate swam for the shore. It sounds like the plot of a horror movie. That's absolutely, and, yeah. Uh, the, the villagers are saying that they want an official investigation as to what the hell is in this lake. Now, how much truth to this, is there to this story? I don't know. Is it newspaper well, hyperbole? That, that's what we I wanted to get into know. as well, truth. I mean, and you know, we never know no. unless we can get over there, interview the witnesses. Yeah. And that's and why you want. And that's why you want the sponsor. And, 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 and of that's course, what we want to, that's just one of the many, many expeditions we want to do. We want to go back for the death worm. We're going to go back and look for the almasti. Yeah. I want to go for the Tasmanian wolf or thylacine. Oh, that sounds interesting. The, the incredible um, dog-like striped marsupial carnivore of Australia and, and Tasmania, officially yeah. extinct, but everyone yeah. calls it the healthiest extinct animal you'll ever meet. <laughs> it's, it's been seen by a park ranger, a zoologist, no one's managed to catch no. one yet. There's some convincing film and photographs. 
So, so again, I'm, 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 I'm going to come back to all this. Where is the science behind some of this? Because I mean, th there'll be people watching this that, that you know that won't quite. To, you know, obviously, they'll have a more of a sceptical mind, won't they? Some people. Well, <coughs> if you're asking why these things haven't been found yet, it's because no one has the resources to look for, or no one's putting the resources in to look for them. Now, even in this age of of computer satellite mapping of the world, you can't see through jungle canopy or forest canopy. There's great swathes of Australia, Asia, Africa, South America that are still unexplored. I remember in my university days looking at the most up-to-date maps and there were masses of, of land that just says insufficient data on. Even native people don't go to these places. Now, if enough time and money were put into this, someone would eventually find something. But it's not going to be easy. The, the snow leopard, it's an animal we're all familiar with. When they first tried to film them in the wild, that's an animal we know exists. Yeah. Do you know how long it took for them to get the first film C of it? I can imagine some time. Six years. Six years, wow. Right. That's okay. for a known animal. Yeah. So if you're talking about a cryptid, a, a rare animal that is unknown, right. who knows how long it's going to take. Right, right. But it'll take time and it'll take money. And what's your website for people to get in contact with you? Sir? It's www.cfz.org.uk. And people can email you from there and yeah, get in contact yeah. with you directly? My, yeah, my email is, uh, is uh, richard at cfz.org.uk. And like I say, if there's any company that wants to sponsor us, we're more than happy to, right. to plug their product. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, Richard. It's been my pleasure. Well, stay tuned because after the break, we'll be speaking via video the link to the conspiracy author, David Icke. Stay tuned. If you like what you watch, then don't forget to follow us on Facebook and Twitter for the latest updates on The More Show. Remember to subscribe to our YouTube channel for new weekly television and radio shows.